Thank you very much. I'm very glad to be here. Uh, I've been working on internet development for about 30 years. Uh, I went to Washington in 1988. And my claim to fame is that I helped Al Gore organize the first congressional hearing about the internet exactly 30 years ago. Nobody showed up. <laughs> Because the internet was only 100,000 people, it was all academic researchers. But even then, we understood how profound this technology was going to be. And what I thought I would do is share very briefly how I see the internet developing over the next 10 years, and particularly cloud services that are going to enable countries throughout the world to do things that were only possible at the very largest, most sophisticated, wealthy companies. I've been working in this area for a long time. I'm here uh, as a representative of Cloudflare, which is an internet security firm. But the real reason I'm here is that for three years I was a professor at Georgetown University in internet studies. And before that, I worked in the Clinton White House on internet technology. And so I'm going to share with you some of the things I learned at Georgetown and at the White House. I'm a physicist. I'm not a political scientist or an economist, so I, I think I'm in a minority here. I'm not going to do any equations. How many other physicists do we have here? Only, oh, we got three, okay. Um, but no equations, no jargon. But I will give you a few numbers, and I'll talk a lot about the trends that I see developing. When I was at Georgetown, I taught in the Communications, Culture, and Technology program. Technology was the easy part. Communicating about this stuff is the hard part. And changing the culture so you can adopt the technology is even harder. So most of my talk will focus on that aspect of this. How do we get citizens of Serbia and the other Balkan states to aggressively adopt technology that is new and different and evolving as quickly as the internet and the cloud? One of my favorite slides shows the march of technology. You can imagine hardware races across the slide because the hardware is always developing fastest. Then we develop the software to use the new capacity that new chips and new networks can provide. And rather slowly, the people catch up and learn how to use the technology. Even slower is the organizational change that will enable the people to really use the new tools they have. And way off the slide, normally 10 to 15 years behind, is the policy. That's both good and bad. It would be good if policy moved faster so it could push the technology even faster. But the reason it can be good is if the technology isn't anywhere near the, the technology, it may not be slowing down what's happening. And that's been my job, really, for for 30 years, trying to make sure that technology does not find itself hindered by policy decisions that governments around the world have made. I've been working with countries every corner of the globe to SSS, Stop Stupid Stuff. I'm very busy right now. There are lots of very stupid proposals about how to regulate the internet, how to, how to hold back the cloud until we figure it out. I'm going to share some bumper stickers and tweets today. As I say, I've taught in Georgetown, communications, culture, and technology. Many of the people in the offices near me were in communication and journalism. They taught me a lot about how to say really important things in eight or nine words. We have a president in the White House who's doing a pretty good job of making policy by tweet. But we all need to be doing that. We all need to be conveying how important these technologies are in clear, simple terms. As a professor, I used to give lots of reading assignments. I'm going to give you at least five reading assignments today. The first one is called Microstyle, The Art of Writing Little. It's a masterful book, about 80 pages, written by a linguist, and it will tell you how to write very simple messages to convey very complicated topics in a way that people will remember. And not only remember, but repeat. And that's the key. 
get ideas to go viral. While I'm at it, I'll give you my Twitter handle, Mike Nelson. Believe it or not, I was the first of 50,000 Mike Nelsons to get on Twitter back in, in 2008. I was the Obama representative in the first ever presidential Twitter debate. Three days debating telecom policy, innovation, e-government, 140 characters at a time. I think I won. Anyway, so I'm going to keep it very brief. I know we don't have a lot of time, and I want to get to the discussion, because that's what professors do if they're doing a good job, is they're provocative and they get a discussion going. So let me share some tweets. Tweet number one. In the next 10 years, we will see twice as much innovation and disruption and opportunity as we've seen in the last 20 years. And if we do everything right, we will see four times more innovation and disruption. The second point, let's stop talking about the internet or even the internet of things. Let's talk about the cloud of things and the integrated system that we're building. We're not just building a communications network anymore. We're actually building a global computer. And if we do this right, it's not just the cloud of things with 50 or 100 billion different devices. It is the coat. I told you I wouldn't use acronyms, but this is my favorite acronym. C-O-A-T, the cloud of all things. Anything that's worth 20, 30 euros will probably have an internet connection in 10 years. And it will be feeding data into the cloud where we're gonna be able to understand what's going on. It may just be a very simple device. It may be a chip on my glasses that tells me where I misplaced them. But it's gonna be so cheap and easy, if we do it right, that that's what we'll have. This sort of seamless coat connecting everything. This is already happening. The next phase of computing goes beyond the cloud. Today, Google, Amazon, IBM, they have these massive data centers that do much of the world's computing. But each of those companies has a few dozen very large data centers in a few dozen locations around the world. The next phase is edge computing. Some people call it serverless computing. It's really a combination of both. And that's where we have Computing power distributed in thousands of places, all working together. At Cloudflare, we offer something called Cloudflare Workers. We already have 154 data centers, including one just a few kilometers from here in Belgrade. That makes the computing power more accessible, makes it easier for people to interact with that computing power, to store data. It's a great benefit for companies in the gaming business, or the banking business, or stockbroking, where milliseconds matter. And that's different. It's a fundamentally different architecture when you're going a few kilometers rather than hundreds or thousands of kilometers to get your data and to store your data. We're working with companies like Google. I was just in Bahrain at the Amazon Web Services Conference because our data centers can work with their data centers to make it all work together and make it more accessible. That's my next tweet. We don't want a cloud. Heaven forbid that Amazon or Google become the only cloud service. And we don't want clouds. We don't want to have to move, you know, do something in this cloud and then do something else over there. We want the clouds working together so we can seamlessly move data back and forth. And last week, Cloudflare, Microsoft, a number of other cloud companies announced an initiative to make it much cheaper and easier for cloud services to work together, and to allow you to move your data from one cloud service to another as your needs develop and as you uh, find better ways to use cloud services. The internet is a network of networks, and the cloud should be a cloud of clouds. Another point that I want to stress is that Serbia, Bahrain, Cyprus, which is where I'm living this year, these countries are going to benefit most from the cloud of clouds for several reasons. 
first, they're going to have access to the most sophisticated tools that they didn't have access to before. They're going to have computing power in country that was never there before. And they're going to be able to move faster because in many cases they don't have the existing companies competing with those cloud services. We've read the book of Genesis. God created the world in six days. How was that possible? There was no installed base. And in many countries, that's the case. And countries that aren't as well developed as Serbia will probably have even more of an advantage. We're putting data centers in places like Somalia. Our last data center was opened in Ulaanbaatar in Mongolia. We are dramatically reducing the time it takes to access data and websites in Ulaanbaatar and throughout Mongolia. And there are brilliant people in Mongolia. I went to MIT. They have online courses. One of their star students was from Ulaanbaatar. He actually got every single question right in the online exams. I have talked too much, so I'm going to leave this with one last tweet and then get into the Q&A. As you design your policies and your corporate strategies, remember four things. Foster competition, foster partnership, foster <laughs> transparency, but most of all, foster innovation. That's what's going to make a difference. We now have more tools than ever before to do all those four things, and I look forward to a lively discussion and particularly look forward to the Q&A. Thank you very much, Michael Nelson. The Book of Genesis and the tweets.